Welcome. Yeah, thank you. So my understanding is that Relativity Space makes 3D rock makes 3D printers that make engines that make rockets. So are you a 3D printing company or are you a, a launch provider? Yeah, uh, so we are a launch service provider. Um, so a satellite company would that wants to launch to space would give us their satellite and say, put this on a rocket um, and fly it at this date and this time. Um, but we've also built what is the world's largest metal 3D printer ourselves um, to actually print an entire launch vehicle as well. Um, so it's a way to make the, that service much cheaper and faster to access. So my understanding is that a lot of the people at your company used to work at Blue Origin and SpaceX, and you were actually doing 3D printing for Blue Origin. Why not convince Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk to kind of do this in-house? Why start your own company? Yeah, uh, so I, I ended up buying the first metal 3D printer at Blue Origin, which was convincing Jeff um, and Blue to, to go down metal printing. But it was very clear at the time that going kind of like, you know, they're really looking at uh, this part here, this part there, um, which one makes the most sense business-wise to, to print first. Um, so kind of this bottoms-up approach versus we were very committed to taking a top-down approach, you know, really thinking like in 10 years, um, five years, you know, four years, like kind of working backwards, uh, why wouldn't you just 3D print an entire rocket? Um, because you can make the whole thing uh, with about 100 times fewer parts. Um, some more complicated parts, but far fewer of them. So I guess I'm not, maybe I'm not fully understanding the advances that have come in 3D printing. I mean, what can't you print if you're printing the engines and the rockets? I mean, that's basically like 99% of everything. I mean, besides the fuel, is there something that is non-printable? Yeah, uh, so we're printing about 95% of, of the parts on the rocket. Um, so the 5% we're not are electronics, uh, computer chips, you know, what are called harnesses or electrical cables that connect everything together. Um, and then also there's some rubber kind of sealing parts uh, and valves that we're not printing. Um, but everything else is, is printed um, and designed from scratch for, for this new method we've come up with. Okay. And your company just came out of stealth mode. My colleague Ashley yeah. Vance at Bloomberg kind of did a big piece about you in Business yeah. Week a few weeks ago. Um, what's the sort of timeline that you've promised investors in terms of the next big milestones? Yeah, sure. So, so what we've hit to date, um, we've actually tested our 3D printed engine at NASA Stennis Space Center over 80 times. And we actually did our 81st test uh, 10 minutes ago, um, and it was a success. Uh, so we have done a lot of engine testing. We've built uh, what this very large printer is, um, you know, expecting first flights uh, in kind of the 20, late 2020 time frame. Um, but really, you know, we don't think this is a, a market that's, you know, you have to be first to market. Um, we want to build at relativity uh, the launch vehicle that's, that's like last to market, um, much like Google was, was like the last search engine. Um, and that's just because rockets are so uh, economically and physically like kind of dominated by physics um, and, and the economics of how much labor goes into a rocket, um, you know, how big it is and how much payload it can take, that coming up with what we think is the best long-term process that will be the best process even 50 years into the future um, is really what we're going after. So who are your customers? You mentioned you're going to be a launch provider. Is it small satellites, CubeSats? Can you eventually make a bigger rocket that could do larger payloads? Like where do you see yourself yeah. fitting into the launch market? Yeah. yeah, so initially, so our launch vehicle uh, called Terran uh, is a 1,200 kilogram to low Earth orbit vehicle. So think like a Fiat 500 sized uh, satellite. Um, so not CubeSats, <laughs> not the school bus sized satellites that SpaceX uh, and Blue Origin are, are going to launch with Falcon 9 and then New Glenn. Um, but, but this is kind of the Goldilocks zone. It's actually an emerging market um, where established companies uh, like uh, Boeing, Telesat, OneWeb, um, Iridium, like these are kind of some of the big names in the space industry, um, already have uh, capability in space that's operating. So it's not, it's not really startups starting from scratch making CubeSats. It's more established companies doing uh, what's called low Earth orbit constellations. Um, so it's you know, hundreds to thousands of satellites uh, much closer to Earth's surface so that you can actually have low latency uh, internet on the order of 50 milliseconds or less um, internet with these kind of networks that have terabit capability, um, as well as Earth imaging, where you can actually image uh, every point on the Earth every day and then start using machine learning and, and kind of data analytics to figure out more um, about, about what's going on on the planet. Um, so is, is relatively value proposition just that you can do this cheaper because you're, th you're 3D printing the rocket and so you're saving an enormous amount on labor costs? 
so it is cost, but actually more important than cost because, because you can imagine, I mean, we're not the only player going into the launch space as a startup. Um, there are other companies that are venture backed and have solid funding, but um, we're really creating a new way to make rockets that iterates much faster. And that's very, very important in the long run. Um, so it takes us about 60 days to build a whole rocket um, once we fully developed our technology, which is crazy fast. Like that yeah. compares <laughs> with um, 18 to 12 months for a traditional process. And then you have a factory with kind of a set uh, amount of tooling that can't really change and morph with the design. Um, versus for us, our factory being a 3D printer, we really view as software defined automation. Um, so that you're actually able to use software to change the design every 60 days. Every time you make a new rocket, it can look a little bit different and be a little bit more optimized um, so that it's really a, a new way to kind of evolve something as complex as a rocket on a much faster timeline. Um, and I think that's the dominating thing that would then make no one be able to catch up with us in the future. So Morgan Stanley was out with a report today about venture capital interest in space and the sort of private space companies, and there are 90 private space companies now. I don't think mm -hmm. I realized that there were that many. And they kind of define the market as you know launch providers, satellite companies, asteroid mining, mining, space tourism. Does it feel all of a sudden very crowded? I mean, is there a shakeout coming, or does it feel like this is just the beginning and we haven't even learned about all of the companies that are probably out there operating in stealth mode? Yeah, uh, I mean, I can tell you right now, there's definitely more than 90 companies. Um, I know a few that are in stealth mode that I'm friends with. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think m a lot more private investment is going into space. Um, there are more companies. I think, you know, the availability of seed and, and I would say seed capital is quite high. Um, series A, you know, a little bit less, but then kind of Series B and onward. I mean, there is kind of this... Uh, divergence, much like you see with most startup ecosystems where, you know, people are kind of leading the pack and really separating themselves um, as leaders in the space. And I don't think, I, d I don't even think space is a market. I mean, you're more looking at whether it's an infrastructure company in a lot of ways like we are. Um, I mean, we're really getting satellites to space. Um, and then satellite companies, you know, like Planet that are doing Earth imaging are really data companies at the end of the day. They want to sell insights and more data about the planet. Um, and so I, I think, yeah, space is just the venue for where uh, companies are operating. So you've raised your Series A. Yeah. Are you in the process of raising a Series B? Uh, so we're always talking with people uh, to, to kind of find, find uh, investors to partner with. So. Okay, I'll try to ask this another way. Um, <laughs> yeah. what, what's the inbound interest been like? Because within venture capital, are there certain firms that really understand space as a as a as an emerging market and then there may, maybe are larger firms that are sort of like they've got one partner who's sort of taken space as their as their big interest mm -hmm. yeah i mean i would i would say that's largely the case where there's at least one partner in a lot of the you know firms that are out there that that has learned a lot about space um since it is you know a very kind of big uh, area where a lot more capital is flowing in um, but for us, you know, we, we uh, you know, started in Y Combinator. Um, we actually raised our seed round from Mark Cuban, um, which was a cold email uh, like a week after we said we're starting the company, and then he gave us our entire seed round within this You cold five. emailed him? Yeah, we cold emailed Mark Cuban um, with the email tagline, you know, space is sexy, 3D printing an entire rocket. Um, there was like two months of due diligence after, but, you know, he gave us half a million dollars. Uh, kind of that was like our first investor we talked to. So you know, subsequent rounds were certainly. That was a good email. <laughs> yeah, no, it worked out. I mean, I think you know our team is very strong. So my co-founder worked at SpaceX. Um, you know, we have a good number of of people that you know are, are very experienced in private space uh, industry, and so we really view ourselves as generation two of that. Right. Well, it seems like in aerospace in general, there's there's sort of like old space, which would be like Boeing, Lockheed, ULA. Yeah. Um, and then new space is sort of dominated by, I guess, SpaceX and Blue Origin, and then new new space or Space 2.0 a lot of would be a lot of the startups. Why why the need to sort of break you know be disru disrupt the disruptors? Wasn't it was it at all possible to sort of do what you're doing in house? Um, so so yeah, I mean from Blue and SpaceX specifically, they're focused on on reusable rockets. Um, so don't get me wrong, I think the inevitable future is probably like a 3D printed reusable um, automatically you know, assembled rocket. I mean, at that point, you've kind of maxed out all your economic parameters of, of how good the technology can get. 
Um, but the, the thing is, no one's really focused on the, the full 3D printing of a whole product aspect. Um, and that's something that we believe, you know, we're, we're very, very focused on launch, um, but it is fundamentally valuable to the entire aerospace industry. Um, being able to 3D print and fly something as complicated as a rocket, um, you know, then you can start to look at aviation and aircraft, and there are other applications. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it was valuable to start a new company um, that's 100%, like, we're all in on that. Um, we, we're going to live or die based on our ability to be the best in the world um, at 3D printing for, uh, for rockets. So. so you have 14, roughly 14 employees right now. What is the hiring pipeline like? I mean, is the United States producing enough aerospace engineers? I mean, Southern California is a great place to be for that, but... Yeah. Is it a hot field now in universities? Where are you hiring from? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's no question increasing uh, as far as the talent pool. Um, that's really, I think, it starts at university. More people are going into, into aerospace. Um, I mean, I will credit definitely companies you know, like SpaceX has generated a lot of excitement. Um, I mean, it's a crazy adventure. Like, you're, you're actually joining a company um, you know, like for us. So our long-term mission is we want to 3D print the first rocket on Mars. Um, so actually, our, our technology and mission of making this kind of small footprint automated factory uh, to then build rockets uh, is exactly what you're going to need to scale an interplanetary society. So if you believe, um, which I do, that you know, Elon will send people and NASA is going to send people to Mars and we're actually going to go build this uh, city and, and start um, settling Mars, that you're going to need a whole bunch of other technologies. Um, and so we're just lucky that we have a near-term business case, uh, which is, we believe, very lucrative. Um, but there, it's actually on path to this kind of long-term future. And I think that attracts people on those kind of missions. So this week, President Trump sort of signed a directive that is asking NASA to go back to the moon, which surprised some people, I guess, because it didn't have a timeline or any funding associated. What do you, I mean, what ex, is the moon exciting to you at all? Are you in the Mars camp? Yeah, I, I'm more in the Mars camp personally, um, ju just because, I mean, it, it is true that, you know, it, if you're actually talking about building a city that's going to be self-sustaining, um, Mars has the best conditions to do that. Um, the only disadvantage is that it is further away. Um, so if you're going to test uh, technologies out, you know, everyone looks at the moon and says, well, it's so much closer, you can see it. Um, it only takes a few days to get there instead of months. Um, depending on the orbits, right? Depending on the orbits, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think that's, that's kind of the unfortunate thing that makes the moon look very attractive um, near term to, to be able to go to. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm Camp Mars for sure. So in the future, I mean, 10 years from now, what, what could Relativity be doing on Mars besides 3D printing the rocket so that everyone can come back? I mean, can yeah. you 3D print the civilization that Elon wants us to all live in? I mean, is there, I'm just sort of yeah, trying to sure, imagine sure. 3D printers on Mars and what they could potentially build. Yeah, so, th so this is where it gets really interesting um, is because Mars, like, I mean, any factory that's going to print rockets on Mars, again, can certainly print um, other things that you need, whether it's cars or structures to live in um, or other machinery and tooling, which then means that same type of factory and a lot of the lessons learned um, you can develop on Earth to make other products too. So it's actually using Earth and Mars kind of as these test beds of each other, um, which I think really gets to where you want to be um, if you do have big long-term ambitions like we at Relativity do. Um, you want to make sure that what you're developing is on path to something that's going to matter later. Okay. What is your relationship like with NASA right now? You, you currently are testing your engines at their facility in Mississippi, but do you have like a contract with them or a pilot or an RFP or are they a potential partner down the road? Yeah, so we have many contracts with NASA. Um, so our relationship to start was we actually pay them to use an existing test stand. So this is a way, um, I mean, for literally a, yeah, a two-person startup, um, we actually raised our Series A and all of our funding to date when it was just me and my co-founder um, on background and reputation and, and kind of early prototypes alone. Um, and so, you know, with that, when we were two people, we also got into this NASA test stand, um, which was our first agreement with them. And then uh, since then, we've won one and a half million dollar uh, agreement to keep testing there. And then we kind of have some, uh, you know, future looking things that we're doing with them on launch pads. 
Um, I testified to the US Senate this last summer on public-private partnerships. Um, so that was really talking about how startups have unique needs, you know, eight, the 18 to 24 months of runway, um, and needing to scale and grow quickly, and how governments and, and organizations like NASA can help uh, partner with startups. Because um, we don't really want to be spending our expensive equity money on infrastructure and uh, things that people have done before. We want to do it on you know, 3D printers and new, new technology. Has NASA been pretty startup friendly? I mean, do they get it? Because they, as an agency, it seems like you know, they don't have an administrator right now. It's a, it's a big bureaucracy. They're seen as being slow moving, but are, have they been pretty embracing of the relativity model? Oh yeah, no, they definitely have. Um, I mean, we, yeah, like I mentioned, we did the test earlier today. Um, you know, doing, doing 80 tests of an engine uh, in, in like the last less than 12 months um, with the team and kind of even the size of the NASA team uh, that they have with the capital they've spent is, is pretty like categorically insane um, from what is kind of the baseline for being able to, to build a test stand, you know, make your own um, and design the engine and test. So they've been great. Yeah. And your engine is going to use methane and oxygen yeah. as the propellant. Yeah. And could you talk a little bit about why that's better than LOX or like sort of the evolution of propellant as a as sure. A thing. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. So my, I would say it's more normal to use liquid oxygen and kerosene or RP1. Um, and we're using liquid oxygen and liquid methane. Um, it actually simplifies the rocket design quite a bit. Um, it's really been branded as like the propellant of the future, um, and that's because you, you can make it more easily on Mars, so um, SpaceX and Blue are both designing future engines um, to use that propellant combo. It is technically harder to do, um, but you know we, uh, I'm like less worried about tackling hard technical challenges as long as they pay off on a business uh, like outcome in the future. Mm -hmm. So does Relativity have any customers yet? I mean, is there a sort of a manifest that's being built out? Do you have satellite operators that are agreeing to launch with you? Yeah, so we have close to a billion dollars in MOUs. Um, so those have kind of varying degrees of, of firmness to them. Um, we haven't announced uh, specifically who they are yet. Um, but they're pretty substantial customers and we're excited by the inbound um, that we're getting now that we're out of stealth and uh, keep hitting milestones. Where would you launch from? Um, so we're talking really with all, all the launch sites uh, in the US, but that the really major ones are Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. It's um, a beautiful, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> uh, Cape Canaveral in Florida um, on both the Air Force and the NASA side. And then there's a launch site up in Alaska uh, as well, and then one in Georgia. So they're kind of all around, but the most popular ones are Florida and Vandenberg. And it's kind of hard to get, I mean, it's, they're getting crowded. I mean, this Yeah, they are. Yeah, they <laughs> are. Yeah. Booking time is actually getting harder. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to your earlier point with all, you know, kind of more launch startups, um, there is limited infrastructure. And so actually making agreements to take this infrastructure over from NASA and develop your own pad on top of it, that's actually a pretty big deal. Um, because you know, once once they're all gone, it's going to be very very hard for new companies to come in and, and really grow. So, do you have like pretty insane capital requirements to pull this off, or is it cheaper to do what you're trying to do than people realize? Like, I'm just thinking of the electric yeah. car example or the autonomous car example. I mean, it, yeah. it's like the rule of thumb is that it still is going to take you a billion dollars to make a brand new car. But yeah. for a rocket, you're, it sounds like what you're saying is like, no, no, we can actually do this pretty cheaply. Yeah, it, it's way less than a billion. Um, I'll tell you that off the bat. Um, but, but yeah, it's still to get to first launch. There's kind of a minimum you know, time and skill set um, it takes. And plus, you know, we're making our own printing technology, making good progress uh, you know, with, with, real, with little capital so far. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think it's less about getting to first launch. Um, and it's much more about what do you do after. And I think no one else is thinking about what do you do after. And that's mostly what we're thinking about, which is scaling. Um, you know, removing as much of the, the kind of bottlenecks to launch production, um, streamlining more automated techniques like 3D printing, um, and that that's going to help us grow to be the best in the end. Mm -hmm. So space is all about moments. You know, man on the moon, the Challenger explosion, Elon landing a rocket on a drone ship, like, you know, Blue Origins just had a pretty successful test this week. Like, what's the next big moment that's going to kind of inspire the American people, because we're still not flying humans from US soil yet. American mm -hmm. astronauts are still taking the Soyuz. So mm -hmm. I, I, it's hard for me to know whether like the public at large is as excited about space as 
investors seem to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, no, no question I've seen kind of this disproportionate excitement around um, flying people. Uh, you know, it, it definitely my friends that uh, are in like the film industry or other industries are like most excited about that. Um, so I think, you know, Falcon Heavy, like that'll be really exciting. Um, you know, from Elon's tweets, like we're all really curious to see what happens. Um, I, I'm, I'm uh, optimistic, like, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's a big one. Um, yeah, that's probably the biggest one, like near term. Near term, um, Falcon Heavy, I think that's supposed to be January, supposedly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and then um, before we wrap up, I have to ask you, um, Overrated or underrated? So I'm going to okay. list 11 companies and trends in techs, and you can sort of give a thumbs up, thumbs down, or say yeah. whether you think they're overrated or underrated. And um, although we're running towards the end, if you anything, if you want to speak out about why on any of these, so yeah. Bitcoin. Yeah. So I'm, uh, the, the biggest thing I know about Bitcoin is like I'm friends with Brian Armstrong at Coinbase, and uh, so I just have to probably quote him as like un, uh, underrated so far, like room to grow. Okay. Yeah. Blockchain. Uh, that's probably some, actually aerospace blockchain, I think is underrated. Um, I think it'll do more than people think. Okay. AI. I would say overrated for a lot of the applications people talk about. Mm -hmm. Facebook. Um, I'm a lurker too, like uh, I said <laughs> earlier. So. Google. Google. Um, Underrated. <laughs> Autonomous cars. I think probably overrated as far as when it's going to happen, the timeline. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Tesla. I would actually say underrated. Uh, yeah, I, I think they can figure it out. I know that maybe <laughs> by the day. Uh, coffee, but, yeah. <laughs> and then the last three are sort of, uh, sort of interesting. Uh, Blue Origin, SpaceX, and NASA. Sure. Uh, Blue Origin, definitely underrated um, as far as the media portrayal is concerned. So. Why, do, why do you think that is? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, Jeff does have like this very uh, patient approach. Um, and I really think long term, like he's shown that that works, um, convincing people to be patient and think for the long run. Um, SpaceX, I think, yeah, that, that one's a little harder to answer out. I may pass on them. And NASA. Um, and then NASA, yeah, it's kind of similar. It's just NASA's complicated. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm excited for, for like some of their bigger missions, like if they go to Europa and that kind of stuff. I think that'll be, that, that's like underrated. I think that's a huge one, so. Great, well, thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, appreciate it.